Hello, welcome to the Better Outcomes Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Each episode, we bring you a conversation with leaders across the healthcare industry, exploring topics ranging from new treatment techniques and interventions to novel service delivery methods and business models. And now your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions, a leader in patient engagement and retention strategy. Let's explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Well, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Better Outcomes Show. I'm your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions. You can learn more about us and how we fill clinics with engaged clients and patients who value the services that you provide at www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. That's rehab, the letter U, practicesolutions.com. All right, this week we've got an interesting conversation for sure that will hopefully be a little bit of a, uh, a cause for thought, for further thought about healthcare and the way we provide services to everyone in society um, from a case of a single payer system. So um, the person who I was, I'm speaking to this week, Dr. Murray Sabrin, is a PhD, former professor. He'll give you a little bit about his uh, background at the beginning of the conversation. But he wrote a book called Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single-Payer System. Now, I know we've had Ron Baker and Ed Kless on the show previously from The Soul of Enterprise talking about this conflation between insurance and health care and the differing incentives given our current, this is specific for the US here, but given our current dynamic of fee-for-service structure here in the United States and what that does to misalign incentives and really drive up the cost of care while sometimes, in many cases, lowering the, the overall quality of care and the clinical outcomes that we get. Dr. Sabrin wrote this book really as a thought-provoking uh, piece, but also as a piece to really drive the the public discourse, public discussion around who should be paying for health care in the first place, and what happens when it's when those things, the price system, for example, gets altered either through regulatory uh, changes or regulatory burdens or just uh, marketplace and economic changes. So. Hopefully, this discussion is thought-provoking and kind of moves the needle a little bit in this discussion about who should pay for health care, um, what's the best system, is a single-payer system really where we should be moving to in this country, um, and then what type of single-payer system are we talking about. So without further ado, here's Dr. Murray Sabrin talking about a universal medical uh, or a single-payer system in healthcare. Well, hey, Dr. Sabrin, welcome to the show. How are you? Well, thank you, Rafi. Pleasure being with you today to discuss, I think, one of the most important issues facing the American people that will have, is having a huge impact on their lives, and that's about uh, medical care. Yes. Yeah. I want to talk all about that, the whole universal medical care idea or medical, uh, universal medical care idea. Um, but before we do that, just kind of give us a background of um, you, yourself, and your work, and then we'll kind of dive right into to healthcare. Well, uh, if you want to start from the beginning, it was uh, 72 uh, years ago, I arrived in America with my older brother and parents who were the only ones in their families to survive the Holocaust. Holy and Christ. I was born in West Germany uh, uh, right after World War II. And we settled in lower Manhattan. And then from there, we moved to the Bronx, grew up there, got married in 1968, um, uh, got an undergraduate degree in history, geography and social studies education, began my career in the New York City school system realized that that was not going to be my future and um, picked up a master's degree in social studies education and then uh, uh, entered uh, Rutgers for a, a full-time uh, uh, graduate student. And uh, this year is the 40th anniversary of my doctorate. Uh, October 1981, I received my doctorate on uh, in the geography department at Rutgers on um, 
how inflation affects local economies. And I had the great pleasure to have Murray Rothbard as a member of my dissertation committee. Oh, wow. I'm only one of two people in the whole world who had Murray Rothbard as a member of their dissertation committee for their doctorate. So um, that was a great experience. I learned a lot uh, uh, with uh, his writings about it and all the Austrian school writings about uh, inflation and money and uh, economic history. And the, the uh, doctorate was basically, or the dissertation was basically how money enters the system and affects local economies because the national CPI is an aggregate of local CPI. Yes. And when I read Man, Economy and State, Rothbard's uh, economic treatise, he had a section there on how money diffuses through a society, through the economy, and that uh, causes price inflation and distorts the, uh, the structure of production. So uh, that's what I did in this dissertation. and. Uh, one geographer from the University of Chicago said this was a breakthrough dissertation on how we study uh, the economy and uh, inflation. And now with inflation being the new, in the news again, uh, my dissertation topic and uh, what I wrote about the Fed a few years ago, my uh, book on the Fed, why the Federal Reserve is uh, the enemy of uh, sustainable prosperity. And of course, it's the enemy of savers, because here yeah. we are, Rafi. Inflation is running at 5% and we're getting virtually zero on our savings accounts and uh, on our money market accounts. So uh, I have a fairly amount, a fair large amount of money in a money market fund. So I'm losing thousands of dollars each year because the Fed has depressed interest rates, suppressed interest rates to zero, which we should be getting at least the rate of inflation of 5%. So people are savers all across the country are losing hundreds of billions of dollars in interest. And this is lining the pockets of um, of people uh, on the upper end of the income stream on Wall Street because they're getting low interest rates that they're using to uh, uh, speculate in various markets. And so it's another example how government is not our friend, how government policies not only are counterproductive, but they're destructive to the average family. And uh, prior to the Fed book, I wrote a book on how we can create a free, uh, tax-free society which is in line with libertarian ideals about voluntary exchange, that taxation is an involuntary exchange, and we should have a society based upon voluntary exchange. So I went through all the various programs of the federal government and, show, and showed how we can transition out of them into the private sector and nonprofit sector. Yeah. So th this book on uh, universal medical care is sort of a continuation of that, of how we could have a free market in medical care not health care. Health care, I think, is a horse of a different color. We conflate the two. And the point I keep on making in this book is that health care, the person that's responsible for health care is we look in the mirror every morning and we see that person. It's us. Yeah. <laughs> we are responsible for our health care. And what we get is medical insurance. But that, too, has been corrupted because we know in every other area of uh, insurance, insurance is only for catastrophic loss or extraordinary expenses that we otherwise wouldn't have in the course of a day, a week, or a month. For example, you don't have automobile insurance to get new tires or get an oil change. Because if you did, you'd probably get an oil change every few months instead of every yeah. <laughs> 10,000 uh, miles, which is what is recommended today because the synthetic oils are a lot better than they were years ago. We used to get an oil change every 3,000 miles. So that's another example. Uh, of, of why insurance has been corrupted in the medical field. It's um, one, of the, one of the dirty secrets in America is we're overinsured. Let me give you a, a prime example of that. When I was growing up in New York City in the 1950s and uh, you had an illness that your parents couldn't take, up, take care of with a, one of their homespun recipes, they would take you to the doctor, the pediatrician back in the 1950s, and it cost $5 for the visit. Holy My smokes. father was a blue collar worker and he could afford five dollars for an office visit, which didn't happen very often. And there was there was no insurance forms. The, the doctor only had one assistant, a receptionist, who who greeted you and uh, and told you to wait in the waiting room and and probably uh, knew your name and your family's name. And not only that, but the doctor would spend at least a half an hour, close to a half an hour, with you, which was unheard of today. Today, you're lucky if you get 10, 15 minutes with the doctor. So if you needed a prescription. The doctor would fill out the prescription form. You take it to the local pharmacy, and it would cost about four or five dollars for an antibiotic prescription if you needed an uh, antibiotic for three, four, five days to get rid of a upper respiratory infection. Let's say, no insurance forms. It came out of your pocket. So the basic premise of my book, or the one of the basic premises of the book, is that we should 
pay for ordinary expenses out of our pocket. And the way we can do that is we have the fee-for-service doctors, but there's another fee-for-service that is really, really exciting. There's direct primary care, DPC, yeah. where you contract with a physician, you pay a monthly fee for yourself or your spouse or your family, and it's very affordable for the average American family. You have access to the doctor virtually 24 seven, seven days a week if, you, if there's a, a critical situation. And the doctor only has 800 patients. They cap their practice around 800 patients. The typical doctor in an office um, um, practice today usually will have more than 2,000 patients. So you can imagine how little time they can give a patient where, where they may have to see 20 patients in one day or 30 patients in one day as opposed to a direct primary care that may only see five or eight patients in a day. So they could spend enough time with them to get to really know that patient. So that is one aspect of medical care that I think is consistent with, our, with good economic practice, good financial practice, and it would strengthen the doctor-patient relationship where the doctor and the patient would know each other a lot better than today, where it's sort of assembly line medicine. And if you don't see your primary care doctor, they're usually in a practice where you're, where you're handed off to another doctor or another doctor. So in the course of a year, you may see three or four different doctors or, or two years, depending on how often you go. So we can take care of the average everyday expense by having direct primary care. Now, there's a, there would have to be a, a, a revolution in medical yeah. care because most medical students, from what I understand, are going into specialties, which are more high income um, uh, areas of uh, medical care. But I think we could do something very creative in uh, inducing medical students to become direct primary care physicians. What direct primary care physicians have told me when I was uh, researching this book is that doctors are getting burnt out because of the number of patients that they're seeing in the course of a day, course of a month, course of a year. So I think young, young doctors, uh, particularly uh, from the impression I get, want to be a good doctor, want to give their patients the best possible care they can. And it's tough to do that when you have to see, uh, you have over 2000 patients. So yeah. if we had a direct primary care foundation for medical care, I think we'd be in much better shape. Now, what's one way we can increase or create incentives for doctors to become direct primary care physicians? Well, well that was my I question. Think, like, uh, how, when you're talking like a, a whole industry, like the move as it progresses, like specialization is only natural, right? Like the more segmented and the more technology advances, sure. it makes sense to have, well, like a neurosurgeon, for example, right? Well, here's how we could do it. We, we could provide tax incentives for people to go into direct primary care. Actually, we provide tax incentives for what? Buying an electric car, yeah. uh, doing all sorts of things in the tax code. So uh, since we have the tax code, it's not going away any, any uh, away soon. Let's create an incentive for medical students to become direct primary care physicians. And that would uh, free up a lot of resources because uh, they would feel, I think, uh, much at ease in, in starting a practice or jo joining a practice. So you could have three or four direct primary care doctors under one roof. Most of them are either single practitioners or have... Um, uh, two or three doctors working with them in direct primary care. So yeah. that would be, uh, that would be, I think the first step that we need to do is to really restore the doctor patient relationship, which has gone by the wayside, unfortunately, because of the corporatization of medical practices. Hospitals are buying up medical practices where you see five to 10 doctors, they are uh, internists and, um, and uh, family practitioners under uh, one umbrella and hospitals are buying them up. So we got to get away from, I think, the corporate model in medicine. I think that's uh, an example of how corporization is counterproductive. I mean, I grew up in an era when the doctor really knew you. You'd see the doctor, no insurance forms. And I think that's the way to go. We have to go back to really what worked well in, in, uh, in I think, the, the, the days of medicine before Medicare and Medicaid, which I think began the distortions that took place. Yeah. Well, let's, well, let's back up to that then. So... You, when you were growing up, you had an issue, you went to see the doctor. It was a single payer, right? Like you paid. <laughs> you, That's it. you paid the doctor, the doctor did their service and you were all good. So what happened that kind of pushed us in this 
well, I mean, this, this mess that we're in now where we've got these third parties, we've got the government involved, we've got all these different players that have a, a stake, right? There's the, the patient, the provider, the policymaker, and the payer, and they're all kind of grappling for different pieces yep. in this value chain, if you would. Well, what happened is um, we got uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield enter the picture back in the 1920s and 30s. And that's when you started getting prepaid plans. And then you get in the 1970s, the HMOs. Uh -huh. And uh, HMOs sound reasonable. The problem there is you have to be in the network. And yeah. if you go out of the network, you may not get reimbursed. But again, the HMOs, from what I understand, they, they um, it's another umbrella organization where you have a third party pay you. You have an insurance company paying the bills and you pay a copay and you have a deductible. That would be all eliminated on, under direct primary care. It would be the simple pay of a service by you for a monthly fee to get direct primary care. That's a clean, neat way of getting it. Instead of having the uh, HMOs, the PPOs, the uh, uh, physician provider organization. Or, uh, uh, and so you would have a way of getting medical care directly to the patient without these layers of bureaucracy, which add to the cost of insurance. Yeah. And then of course, you've got the third party payer. If you have a traditional insurance company like Blue Cross Blue Shield or some of the others, United and so on and so forth, uh, you, you have to get that through your employer. And as you know, Rafi, one of the biggest mistakes in American economic, financial, social history was the linkage of insurance, medical insurance with the workplace. That was yeah. an outgrowth of the wage price controls during World War II. So here's another example how war and the policies that come out during and after the war distort an economy, in this case, the medical care sector. If yeah. we didn't have employee-based insurance, we'd be in much better shape. And that is an outgrowth of the wage price controls during World War II because employers couldn't raise wages. So what they did was offered a tax-free benefit because the uh, premiums that were used to pay for the insurance companies was not considered taxable income by the IRS. And the, uh, and the insurance premiums were tax deductible for the employers. So the employers got the benefit of, of the tax code. But if you're a single individual and trying to get that same insurance by your, on your own, you couldn't deduct the premiums from your, from your income tax. So there was a skewing of the tax code toward employer-based medical insurance as opposed to the individual going into the marketplace and getting insurance, like they get auto insurance. We don't get auto insurance through our workplace. We don't yeah. get property and casualty through the workplace. We have uh, robust markets for those. We have a lot of competition. And I get in the mail constantly, join this auto insurance company, join that auto insurance company. We can save you money. So as we know from basic economics, the more competition there is, the lower the price will tend to be because people are have to be efficient in order to keep their costs down. And when they yeah. keep their costs down, they can reduce the premiums to their uh, customers. Well, on that so, note, yeah. so what, what is limiting the competition then in the insurance space? Is it that you have to be so, so big to get with these employers and they're able to kind of muscle out the little guys? Or are there other regulatory kind of loopholes that people need to jump through? Well, yeah, each state regulates insurance. Then you got federal mandates on top of that. And so we need to eliminate just about all of those things. And remember, the only reason that you need law is to is to prosecute fraud and force. And so if uh, two people are getting together and have a contract to uh, buy a service or for, uh, uh, buy a, sell a product, you don't need all these regulations that are in place today. So we need to deregulate the uh, healthcare market, the medical care market enormously so we can free it up. Unfortunately, people have learned that insurance is something that comes with the workplace. And that's unfortunate because that's the culture that we live in today. And people can't conceive of that any differently. But now with Obamacare, which is a separate issue, uh, people that can go into the work, uh, into the exchanges and get insurance policies, which from what I understand are really awful for most yeah. people. They're very high deductibles, they're expensive. So uh, even though they're insured, they're really not insured. Uh, and so um, so direct primary care, or at least a, a fee for service is, is, I think, the process that's consistent with free market economics. You want a service, you pay for it. Just as we want cable yeah. service, we pay for it. Just as we want um, 
uh, cell, cellular phone service. We pay for it on a monthly basis and it works out fine. And guess what? Costs have come down, especially in the cellular space, quite a bit. Yeah. There are companies not competing with AT&T, Verizon, and, and T-Mobile, and they're offering uh, prices 50% of what they're charging. Yeah. So what do you say then to, to somebody who might come from this mindset and to say, well, what's the big deal about having you know, my insurance company pay most of my doctor's visit? Like fundamentally, what's wrong with that? I'm paying less. I'm only paying a copay. Like how, well, here, <laughs> how is that wrong? The, yeah. The problem is a lot of these uh, insurance plans, there's a network and your doctor, if it's not in the network, you're out of network and you may not get the same benefits of, of uh, doctors that are in the network. So you may have a doctor that you like that's out of the network and then you, then you have to pay more out of pocket. So again, eliminating the insurance companies for basic coverage would save a lot of money, would save the employer a lot of money. I mean, for a family of four, the premiums tend to be around $20,000 a year. That's a lot of money for insurance that an employer has to pay. And of course, now when I was working, we used to get uh, medical care for free as a, as a state college employee. Then um, under the Christie administration, they increased that. I was paying a third of the premiums. So it was up to about $7,000 a year we were paying. but because of the tax code, we were paying with pre-tax dollars. So I wasn't taxed on that $7,000 that was used to pay for the uh, medical care premiums uh, uh, that the college had with, uh, uh, and the, the college was self-insured. So Blue Cross Blue Shield Horizon in New Jersey was the uh, administrator of, of the plan. So again, it is incredibly comp uh, complex for a lot of people. And it would yeah. be much better off if we just had uh, a, a payment for the patient to the doctor and the doctor wouldn't have any insurance claims to fill out. He wouldn't be penalized if he made an error in the insurance claim that he, that he filed with the insurance company or with Medicare or Medicaid. I mean, there are doctors being uh, prosecuted for making errors on the Medicare forms that they yeah. submit to the government. That's, that, that, that's perverse. That's not the way medicine should be practiced. It should be the doctor patient relationship. So that is the pillar, the foundation of a free market medical system where the doctor and the patient have a contractual relationship to provide a service. Now, what's the next thing? Well, in 1961, my father had a major operation in New York City, Manhattan. He had, through his job, he had Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I don't remember um, there being any financial uh, problem with getting the bills paid. Remember, this is before Medicare and Medicaid, so prices were a lot lower. And this is before the inflation kicked in of the mid 60s that's still with us today. So as I recall, he had the operation, he recuperated from home and there was no family uh, problems paying the bills, if, if there were any bills to pay. So what I'm suggesting we do is create these super health savings accounts or medical savings accounts, where you would put the money in, you'd get a tax deduction for that. The money would grow like an IRA or a 401k tax-free and you take the money out tax-free. So if government officials really believe in providing, or at least put this this way, supporting quality, low cost medical care, then you have to empower the patients to use a term that the left is, likes to use a lot. You got to yeah. empower people to be responsible for their own medical care decisions and have the means to pay for it through this medical savings account, which means that it's not a use it or lose it, that at the end of the year, if you don't use that money, it somehow reverts to somewhere in, 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 in society. No, that's your personal account that stays with you for life. So can you imagine someone who's in their 20s out of college, puts away a few bucks each paycheck and builds up that account? Because we know young people don't use the medical care system very much. So by the time they retire, when they're in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, or whatever, they will have a huge pool of money to pay for medical care bills. Now, we could so you need legislation to do that. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not so confident that the people in Washington are, are brave enough to say, hey, it's too expensive today. We're spending four, the American people can spend $4 trillion in 2021 for medical care. That's about 20% of GDP. That's outrageous. Yeah. You know, 50 years ago, it was around 3% of GDP. So the cost of medical care has skyrocketed because of, uh, Medicare and Medicaid and third party payers and the general inflation that everyone's experienced in the last uh, 50 years. So this super savings account, super medical savings account would take care of uh, more expensive tests that you would have to uh, do or and um, 
and operations that you could do through a let's say the uh, cash facilities like the surgery center of oklahoma yeah let me give you an example of how this would work when i was uh, interviewing a direct primary care doctor for my book she told me about a patient she had here in southwest florida who needed an operation i don't remember if it was a hip or a knee or whatever the local hospital quoted him a price of twenty thousand dollars so this doctor said to this, her patient why don't you call the surgery center of oklahoma and see what they would charge for your operation to make a long story short the transportation from florida to oklahoma the hospital the uh uh hotel stay the operation and everything was a total of five thousand dollars which he gladly paid out of pocket yeah uh, i was interviewed recently by a talk show host about my book and he said he needed an eye operation and uh he was quoted a price of eighteen thousand dollars and he said i'm not going to do it the ophthalmologist says you need to take to get this operation again to make a long story short he got the operation for eighteen hundred dollars yeah and it's much like people this. come in and doing like dental work, right? Like, so my family's from Costa Rica. My mom needed dental work done and it was going to be crazy here. So she flew down to Costa Rica, <laughs> got some dental work for a fraction, a fraction of the cost here. Um, basically, because you're not, you're not doing any of that insurance, right? It's just single. Here's the fee. Here's, the, here's what you're giving me. There is, there's even a better story. I, I uh, picked up at the free market medical association in early August when I attended there due to the book signing for the book. And uh, here's the book, so everyone can see it. Well, they can see it. It's uh, Universal <laughs> Medical Care. Okay, even though we're on video, uh, people can't see the book. It's Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life. I was at a breakfast um, during this Free Market Medical Association uh, conference, and there was a vice president of an upper Midwest manufacturing company, and they were really fed up with the increase in premiums that they uh, were getting for their employees. And I think they had several hundred employees on staff. So what they did was they contracted with a company to bring an MRI machine in a truck to the company's parking lot to provide MRIs for their employees if they needed it for the shoulder, the knees, whatever. The cost of the MRI was $400. So I don't remember if the company paid it out of pocket or the employee paid it out of pocket, but the, but the essence of the story is that same truck with the MRI went down the street to a hospital and the hospital charged six thousand dollars for that same MRI. <laughs> now, what, so what's I heard, the difference between the the cost differential there? Is most of that because of just the regulatory and administrative burden? Of the, well, the, the hospital, hospital remember, the hospital is getting reimbursed from the insurance companies. So the insurance company is going to give them a reimbursement and then they're going to pass that cost along in insurance premiums. That, yeah. That's one reason insurance premiums are so high. Remember, hospitals are very labor intensive and they have a lot of fixed costs. They have a huge plant and equipment that they have to amortize over time. And it, it takes a lot of energy to run a hospital. You've got the uh, water, you've got the electricity uh, and all the other things that you need to run a, a big plant. If, if you're in the Northern States, you have snow removal and all the things that go with make, make sure the uh, plant and uh, and the um, and the uh, parking lot are free from snow and and uh, and whatever else happens during the winter time. So there's a lot of fixed costs to run a hospital. What I envision in in a free market medical care system is that you'd have surgery centers of Oklahoma model throughout the country, where you could have doctors come perform the surgery on an outpatient basis for most operations. And the cost would be 50 to 75% less than you would have to pay in a hospital. And most people, if they had that super health sa medical savings account, that money would be drawn out of that account. And they'd pay gladly instead of paying 10, $15,000 a year. Remember, if you don't use the medical care in the course of a year and you're paying $10,000, that money's lost. Yeah, it's just gone. It's gone. So if you build up an account of $10,000 a year, $5,000 a year over many years, when you need a, a procedure that may cost you three to five or seven thousand dollars, that money is there. That money has earned interest or uh, grown because of the stock market, and it's not going to burden you financially to withdraw money from an account that is specified for medical care uh, expenses. That, to me, is the logical way of dealing with this issue. And I think the average person, especially young people, remember, one of the themes of my book is that people, adults, have to be responsible for their medical care. 
It's the concept of personal responsibility and financial independence. Those are two important ingredients for a free market. You have to be responsible and you have to be independent. And what I'm demonstrating in the book is what are the tools that we could have to give people that financial independence? It's called savings, something I learned a very long time ago when I was a youngster. So here I am in retirement and my wife and I have both saved and we're very comfortable in our retirement because we've saved money in our 401k. My wife has a pension and um, uh, we don't have any worries at this point in terms of uh, medical care costs. Uh, we do have Medicare. We're both on Medicare and supplemental uh, coverage. So uh, whatever out of pocket expenses we have will be fairly minimal. So this is, we, this is why we have to think long term. This is where our youngsters have to be taught what it means to be an adult over 40, 50, 60 years when they got out of college. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think the schools, the colleges do a very good job of that. And that's why a course in personal finance, I think is critical as part of the curriculum. You can start even in the high schools with that. What does it mean to have a savings account, a checking account? What is the stock market all about? What are mutual funds? What are exchange traded funds? So it's part of the whole package. What, what cost could you have as a individual regarding medical care and how do you pay for that? Uh, so I think, you know, so, something that we may want to think about is providing education to employees yeah. about the, how to uh, generate uh, uh, in, uh, income and savings to do that. In fact, I'm currently writing a new book on medical insurance and uh, the workplace. Given the current structure, how can employees get the most bang for the buck? How can employees get the best quality of medical care and not have these uh, huge expenses also? So uh, I'm investigating that and it's fascinating to, to dive into what doctors are now doing given the current structure of the system between Medicare, Medicaid, and third-party insurance, the, the, the cash-only doctors are, seem to be growing by leaps and bounds because yeah. they're not bound by insurance companies. Patients love it because they get to see the doctor, they get to know the doctor, there's very little waiting time. And, and I'll give you an example. We came down to uh, Florida three a few months ago in June, and to get a new doctor, uh, fortunately, we, we, we met a neighbor who's a doctor and he recommended a dentist and she recommended the doctor. So we're able to get a dentist <laughs> and a primary doctor without a problem. And then from that primary care doctor, we're getting specialists because we had specialists in Northern New Jersey where we lived for 40 years. So you have to do this networking for medical care in order to find a, a doctor. But I, I tried to get an appointment with the doctor that was recommended. It was a two month wait. Holy smokes. But, uh, I need to see. I need to see somebody, so I'm seeing somebody uh, very soon to to check out a condition that hopefully is is just a, a transitory thing, as they say. Uh, but it, when you come to a new area, it takes two three months to get a visit. Why is that? I mean, why does it take two three months to get a, a visit for a new an, as a new patient? You should be able to do that fairly quickly. And um, I think if we had direct, more direct primary care doctors and doctors working together in different specialties with a direct primary care doctors and specialties under one roof, sort of like a, a super um, big box store. So instead yeah. of having a, you'd have, a, a, let's say 10, 15 specialties in, in a one big office or one big building. And you could have all those across the country where people can go and get the specialist, uh, the specialist without a problem, uh, with very little waiting. Yeah. And if we had that, I think we'd be in a much better position to provide um, quality medical care without the waiting time that today is getting more and more onerous. So that's the second component is having that super medical savings account that would really allow patients to be in charge. And the key to this thing, Rafi, is doctors posting their prices online. There's no reason that we have this opaqueness regarding pricing. Yeah, And we don't know what doctors are charging us today because, well, because they're not charging you they're charging your insurance company, company and all yeah. we do is pay the copay <laughs> i mean that's that's that people don't know they're clueless and uh again we need so the surgery center of oklahoma you go to their website all the prices are there for the different surgeries that can be done on, at, at the center which to me is we spend more time investigating cars and cell phones than we do our medical care practitioners in terms of uh, what they're charging. Now, charging is one thing, but you also want good quality care. So that takes some time also. The best way to do that, I guess, is get referrals. Um, yeah. 
and you see the ratings on the different websites. So th that's important. So that's the two pieces, the two key pieces, the direct primary care and getting a specialist uh, paid for through the super savings account, or it could be done directly, uh, uh, having a direct primary care uh, specialist as well. Now, the third part is really simple. The reason we have insurance, Rafi, as you know, is to pay for the big ticket item losses. So that if we had major surgery that may cost 50 or $100,000, which I think would come down if we had cash payment, that's what you need a catastrophic insurance policy where you may have a, a $5,000 deductible, $10,000 deductible, whatever, depending on your financial situation. And that would take care of, let's say, long-term uh, uh, cancer treatment or a major uh, heart operation, whether it's a transplant or a kidney transplant or something like that. And you would be in charge of that also with a, a catastrophic policy. So again, those are the three main pillars where the average person today can get quality care. And in the book, I describe how we can transition Medicare and Medicaid patients from, and, and of course the employer-based system that we have today into the free market medical care system. And the fourth pillar is the most exciting one, I think. And that is eliminating the $600 billion Medicaid bill in America today which started out as a very modest program that's turned into a, uh, what, 40 or 50 million people are on Medicaid. How do we address that? I was about to say, well, you're, you're talking about cutting, cutting health insurance for people that are poor, right? Poor and disabled. Well, the, 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 again, the, what most people don't know is most doctors, I don't know if it's most doctors, but many doctors won't accept Medicaid patients exactly. because the reimbursement rate is like $10 or something like that. It's really absurd. So what I'm proposing is... Um, uh, not far from where you are, the uh, Volunteers in Medicine based in Hilton Head, South Carolina, that was started in the mid 90s by Dr. Jack McConnell, who passed away a couple of years ago. And I had the good pleasure of speaking with him in the mid 90s when I first read about it. And um, this is the model based upon the quintessential American concept called volunteerism, where doctors would provide their services for free. You'd have a few hired staff or some. Uh, Facilities may have a total volunteer staff and they provide top-notch medical care for uh, low-income folks in their community. I helped create one in Bergen County, the Bergen, uh, Bergen Volunteer Medical Initiative, BVMI. They're, uh, they're open five days a week. Uh, they're trying to open up six days a week. So they provide a lot of medical care on site and then they partner with the local hospitals and specialists so people can see uh, specialists and get hospital care. Now the hospitals do get charity care in New Jersey. The, the state reimburses them for a certain portion of charity care. I want to eliminate that also and have hospitals raise all that money voluntarily. And we can use the tax code as, as an incentive. Uh, there's an organization called We Do Better where you would get a tax credit, not a deduction, a tax credit for every dollar you donate to a hospital, a college, university, a, a food bank, a homeless shelter, or whatever, dollar for dollar. And that would be exciting. That would be transitioning us from the welfare state to a free market, nonprofit, social service sector. That's, to me, the most yeah. exciting development we could have in this country. And we already have the infrastructure. I just read uh, in the Wall Street Journal recently that Walgreens is uh, partnering with um, a company to put clinics in their... Yeah. Facilities. Village Medical or something like that. They, yes, they just put like yes. five point three billion dollars into that company. This this is the free market at work. CVS does it. Walmart does it. Could you imagine if all the uh, big box stores had uh, clinics for low income folks? They could charge a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. That's that's reasonable yeah. in today's economy, just as a, as a token of appreciation for what they do. And to me, that would. That would save the taxpayer six hundred billion dollars a year. That go a long way to solving the deficit crisis we have in this country. So that would be the, another element of uh, of the free market universal medical care, where uh, low income folks can get quality medical care at these clinics, at uh, uh, nonprofit centers like uh, like uh, based upon volunteers in medicine. And here's my challenge to the super wealthy people in America who think that the government should create a bigger and bigger safety net. If Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, 
Michael Bloomberg, each of whom are worth between 40 and uh, more than $100 billion. They could, and the Bill Gates Foundation has what, I think 45 to $55 billion. If they really wanna leave a great legacy for America and help solve an intractable problem, medical care for the, uh, for the uninsured and low-income folks, they would help create all these centers around the country. It would probably take about 10,000 of them, maybe less, to create that. And you wouldn't need a lot of money to do that because the infrastructure is, is in place to some degree. Or you can build freestanding ones. Not only do I support the Bergen Volunteer Medical Initiative that I helped create in Bergen County, but I support two others financially in New Jersey. I became very um, um, uh, friendly with their founders. They do great work, uh, one in Somerset County, one in Monmouth County, New Jersey. And um, even though I don't have a geographic connection with them, I, these, are, these are great doctors who are providing a valuable service to their community. And uh, this is what we have, doctors who have taken an oath to uh, provide compassionate medical care. And uh, you could have doctors who are retired doing this, 10, 12 hours a week, whatever hours they want. Or you could have doctors who are in practice who can devote, let's say, a few hours a week, and they too could get a tax credit for their volunteer efforts. Yeah. So again, we could use the tax code to incentivize people to do great things in our uh, economy, especially when it comes to medical care. Remember, $4 trillion. Could you imagine if we could reduce that by 50%? Oh, that would sure, free up yeah. $2 trillion of the American people's resources in order to what? get better food, get better transportation, get better clothing, uh, invest for their future, and be more philanthropic. I mean, that is a huge savings to the American people. If we could free up a trillion to $2 trillion or maybe even more, given the examples that I came across, Rafi, we are being, medical costs are overinflated in this country. I mean, by, by oh, a yeah, factor absolutely. of five to 10 times. I mean, the evidence is there from all the... Um, stories that I've heard that in recent years since I started uh, researching this book. It's medical care is uh, way inflated. When you can get medical care at 10%, 20% of what the hospitals are charging. Again, there was yeah. an article I came across in the New York Times. This one um, individual had a, a catastrophic policy and uh, he got an eye operation for $3,000 instead of $20,000. Uh-huh. So there's evidence all over the country that people out of paying out of pocket can save themselves thousands of thousands of dollars for medical care. Yeah, and I mean, we've got, so we haven't had insurance for years, basically since I've been a consultant. My wife is pregnant now and we walked into the hospital and they said, well, normally it's, you know, I think it was $18,000 to do the delivery, do everything that'll cover the whole package. And we said, well, we don't have insurance. They said, $3,800 right out the door and you're good. <laughs> really? You know, like craziness. It's unbelievable. Again, this shows you why the lack of transparency is driving costs through the roof in medical care. And I want to devote my, uh, uh, my time to exposing this and leading the bandwagon for free market medical care, as opposed to Bernie Sanders, universal medical care, um, by the government. One of the uh, doctors I interviewed for my book, who gave me a great review, he is a Canadian doctor that now practices in the United States. He was gung-ho for the single-payer Canadian system. He thought this was going to be great. Then he started practicing medicine, and he saw the long waits that people had to endure in order to get uh, medical care. In addition, his brother nearly died because of misdiagnosis in the yeah. Canadian medical care system. So he read, he's a radiologist, so he read his x-rays correctly and found out what was wrong with him and, and basically saved his life. So now he's practicing in um, the upper Midwest and he loves practicing in the United States, but he now sees the encroachment of the government in medical care. So he's worried about what's going on here, especially in this age of COVID with the mandate, uh, vaccine mandates and other regulations that, that he finds very, very um, intrusive. So yeah, I've always kind of equated it to, um, so I came from the VA healthcare system as a, as a clinician before I left. And that, when, when people talk about universal healthcare and having the government in charge of healthcare, I'm like, listen, 
we don't even trust the VA in a lot of times <laughs> to do things in a timely, efficient manner. Like, and you want to give them the reins of the entire healthcare system just doesn't make sense. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really shocking that people think that you can have trickle down medicine, that you can yeah. <laughs> medicine is, is, uh, can be, can be delivered from, from way up, up, uh, from uh, Washington or the state capitals. And this, this, uh, defies every study we know, a good study about medical care or any other intervention in the economy. It just doesn't work because if socialism worked, the Soviet Union would still exist and China would not have gone to a free market economy, or at least Quasi. have elements of yeah. free market economies. And the uh, countries that are still socialist, like Cuba and North Korea, I mean, the basket cases, economic basket cases, and countries that are allowing med uh, free market medical care, they're doing much better. Even, even the so-called socialist, uh, the single payer systems in Scandinavia, they're, they're, I think, starting to reform as well, because you have to pay a lot in taxes. So when people say they want free medical care, this shows you how illiterate people are when it comes to economics. There's no such thing as a free good. The only exactly. free good is if someone gives you a gift and the government doesn't have any money except what it extracts <laughs> from taxpayers. I and mean, that's the yeah. first principle of, of, uh, um, of economics and government. Government doesn't pay for anything. They're an intermediary. Yeah, you the do. Taxpayers pay everything. <laughs> and the same thing with corporations. Corporations don't pay taxes. Individual shareholders pay the taxes. It's paid through the government, the, 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 the corporate ta tax accounts. Uh, checking accounts, but shareholders own the company. They pay the taxes just as individuals pay the taxes and they pay for Medicare and Medicaid. And by the way, here's another aspect of the, how perverse the system is. Medicare part A is, uh, is free. That's the hospital part of Medicare. Well, guess what? All the billionaires, retired billionaires are getting subsidized by the minimum wage workers with their part A hospital coverage. Yeah. So here's, here's one of my transitions. Every wealthy person in America, what do we define by wealthy? And we can do, use the uh, tax returns. If you're over, if you're retired and you collect and you're getting Medicare and you're earning a million dollars a year, you go off of Medicare completely. You're on your own. You got to get medical coverage on your own. That would free up a substantial number of people in high income areas that would be now on their own, part of the free market medical care system. And then we can lower that every year as people who are making less money, stop putting money away in a super savings account, super medical savings account. So we can do a transition over 10, 15 years, maybe even less, depending on how willing people are to say, hey, I wanna be in charge of my medical care. I wanna save for it. And doctors have to be transparent on their website or what they charge for an office visit, for this procedure, for that procedure. I think we could bring down medical costs quite a bit pretty quickly because you'd get rid of all the people in the office that have to file these insurance claims. Yeah. And that's a lot of people. If you go to any office, there's probably, what, a half a dozen or more people in a large uh, internist practice where you have uh, people filing these claims for Medicare, Medicaid, and the insurance companies. So those jobs would be eliminated they would find other jobs in in, in the in society because right now all they're doing is not providing any value to the to the to the patients to the consumer all they're doing is 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 uh having to deal with the bureaucracy and we know yeah. bureaucracies are very expensive so those are the four main pillars that uh, are in the book that go into greater detail of why it's counterproductive to have what we have today and how we can transition to a universal medical care system. And by the way, one of the other things, remember the book is entitled Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life. There are roughly 2 million births in the United States. So I have a plan where every family, knowing when the woman is pregnant, not the person's pregnant, right? The woman's pregnant, right? As uh, some of the people think that people get pregnant. No, it's a, the woman gets pregnant. Oh, we're, that, we're wading uh, into gray waters now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's let's bring it on here. Let's bring it on. Uh, so I have a plan to how every uh, not only newborn, but every uh, baby in development in, in the womb can be uh, uh, can be covered. So that's in the book as well. And that, it would be a modest. And that is how you would have uh, avoid the whole concept of pre pre um, conditions.
Yeah. That you would, this insurance would uh, uh, cover you for life. And then I, I discuss how we could do that. So again, there is not a lack of innovativeness and creativity in providing coverage, either out of pocket or through the insurance uh, mechanism that would lower insurance costs, get rid of a lot of insurance uh, coverage that is unnecessary. And we would have, I think, the best of all worlds where we get quality care at lower prices, which would free up money for people to do other things. Remember, one of the basic principles of economics is opportunity cost. So yeah. we're spending a ton of money on insurance premiums. That means we can't spend money on a whole host of things that we, those are lost opportunities. And um, the more I think about medical insurance, is if you don't need it, boy, are you spending a lot of money that could have been used for other things. And uh, th that's why, I, I, like I said, I want to uh, get on as many radio and TV shows as possible with this message. And finally, the last thing I think I want to say, and then uh, we can talk, do some Q&A, is I challenge Bernie Sanders to a debate mm. on which universal medical care system we should have in this country. This would be bigger than Ali versus Frazier. <laughs> this would be two New York Jews debating universal medical care. <laughs> should we go through all out for government control of medical care, or should we have the people control their medical care and contract with doctors and, and other providers for that, uh, for that service? That's the vision, Ber the Bernie vision or the Sabre vision. I think that's the, the, the robust discussion we should have in America. And I think if we have that discussion, I think people will realize that they, as adults, they have to be in charge of their life. Yeah. They have to be in charge of what they eat, what they drink, what they exercise, how much time they spend on the computer, how much time they spend on the couch. I mean, being adult means doing things that put you in a good place in life. And unfortunately, too many people think it's not my responsibility for my health, it's the government's responsibility somehow. And that's why we call it health insurance. No, it's medical insurance. We want a mechanism to pay for our bills. And that would be out of pocket and uh, the medical saving account and the catastrophic policy. And I think we'd be in much better shape than we are today. Yeah. Well, we're getting near the top of the hour here. Um, if there are just two main points that you'd want a listener to walk away with from the show, what would they be? Well, I think you have to have to stand up and say, how can I get the best medical care possible at the lowest possible price? And is it the current system that we have today? Why should my employer determine what type of medical insurance I should have? They don't determine what auto insurance we have. We have to be in charge of our medical care. And that includes what, whatever um, arrangement we need in order to cover our expensive bills. But as I point out, those bills would come down dramatically if we had a free market in medical care. And the other thing is, if people are really concerned about members of the community in their town, their city, and they really want to help people get quality medical care, then they have to support nonprofits yeah. based upon the volunteers of medicine or some other uh, uh, arrangement. And like I said, I've been supporting them. I will continue to support them. In fact, the royalties from this book will help support them and free market the educational organizations as well. So the royalties from this book will be going to putting my money where my mouth is, is supporting <laughs> free market education and nonprofit medical centers. And so I urge everyone to get the book because um, the holidays are coming up. The, uh, the Kindle edition is available on Amazon. And uh, believe it or not, the royalties are much higher for the Kindle edition than they are for the paperback. But if you like a paperback, get a paperback. Uh, the Kindle edition, if you have friends who are interested in this topic or you want to give them as a gift, as a way of, for them to explore a, another way to provide medical care, give them as gifts. Give the Kindle edition as a gift. It's uh, less than $9. So uh, for, for 10 gifts, that's $90. What's $90 today for the average person who's who's got uh, some spending money for the holidays and um i hope people do that because the more people that read this book the more i think we can have a robust discussion as to what type of medical care system we should have because today we have a hybrid system government pays more than half, half yeah. of it through medicare and medicaid we have the third party payer we need people to be in charge and i think that's the message you have to be in charge of all your 
um, needs in society, and those needs can be met through the free market. That's the basic message. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Um, where can people find out about you? I know you can get the books on Amazon. Where can people find you, connect with you? Well, my blog, murraysabrin.com, is where I post uh, my, my um, interviews for my current book. Well, I have two current books, the Universal Medical Care book, and the other one is just came out for all the small business owners and CEOs and CFOs navigating the boom bust cycle, an entrepreneur's survival guide. So these are two books that will help people get through the business cycle, the ups and downs of the business cycle, so they can don't get uh, uh, caught up in a, a boom that's that will end badly for uh, them, and uh, how to get to a free market medical care system that's going to save them a ton of money and uh, improve their, their standard of living. So I've got two books out. I've written uh, two books since I retired in July of 2020. And I'm working <laughs> on my third book. I was say, not and much of retirement then, huh? Well, it's tin star. There's no such thing as retirement. <laughs> that's that's my motto is um, yeah. re retire retirement to me is something that I never thought um, was a time where you go and just sit on a chair and uh, watch TV and rock, rock back and forth. I mean, um, I like to be active physically and uh, mentally and researching gives you the opportunity to learn a lot about how this country evolved, especially with the medical care stuff. It's fascinating information. That's why having been a history major and studying history and teaching financial history, which to me is one of the most important things I've ever done as, as a professor, financial history of the United States really gives students uh, an overview of how we evolved from money and banking to where we are today with the Federal Reserve and the manipulation of interest rates and uh, why we're in another bubble and uh, it tends to end badly as we've seen the dot-com bubble end and the housing bubble end in the last 20 years. So uh, uh, my goal right now is to be an educator, speaker, author, and uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, present your listeners with a different perspective on uh, on universal medical care, which most people think single pay means the government. Well, no, the single pay also means the individual. Yeah. And this is where the free market libertarian um, perspective comes into play. It's uh, we have two great I ideologies, not great because they're, they're wonderful socialism and individualism, but they're, they're two competing ideologies for the hearts and minds of the American people. And I intend to uh, be in the arena to promote the uh, free market uh, libertarian perspective on things because it would make things better. It's not strictly for ideology. It's practical. It's practical. Yeah. It works. It gets the goods to the people who need them, who want them, and who can uh, and can pay for them. And um, just as we have choices in automobiles, in clothing, in cellular service, and uh, electronics, I mean, this is what America is all about. It's, it's choice in the marketplace. So we got to have choice in medical, in medical care as well. All righty. That's a great place to end it. So, uh, Dr. Saber, thanks so much for being on the show. Have a good weekend. <laughs> you too. Thank you, Rafi. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. It was definitely very in-depth and very wide-ranging. I know Dr. Saber and people like him that just have been in this world from an economist standpoint and who have all the research and all of the, the data points and everything can really talk at length about the current system and what's going on and how to make it better. And I think we probably could have talked for about two hours <laughs> about this topic. But one of the things that really stood out to me, and it was, it was very apparent in my conversation with uh, Ron and Ed a few episodes ago, and then again it came up with, uh, with Dr. Sabrin here, is the idea of how government involvement or government regulations have unintended consequences, real impactful consequences. For example, the whole price control and wage control regulations that led us to this employer-linked health insurance plan market deal that we've got, where now you've got employees who only have health insurance because of their employer, which means that what? They're not going to be as apt to leave that employer to start a business because what do they do for health insurance? I know many of the people that I work with and that I, the, in the circles that I run in the entrepreneurial realm have that as probably the biggest issue that they've, that they faced personally when it was time to leave W2 employment to start a business or to, to start an enterprise was, 
well, I have a family. How am I going to do health insurance? How am I going to take care of it? And luckily, there are things like health shares and the like that are that are out there that help kind of bur- decrease that burden. Um, but it is something that only happened because of a government regulation or a government um, intervention, which at the time might have been well-intentioned, but it's one of those things that you don't really know until you start messing with incentives. It's hard to see the effects of those incentives and those regulations down the line and the effects that those regulations will have on the pricing of goods and services going forward. So while we, while you may not agree with uh, Dr. Sabrin on what a single payer system should look like, hopefully the conversation sparked some um, internal dialogue or maybe a, a source of dialogue between you and other colleagues and folks about kind of what the what the current problem and the, the dysfunction is in healthcare, specifically in the U.S. and some of the ideas that are being proposed to fix it. Um, I always joke that, you know, I came from the from the Department of Veterans Affairs, and that's where my clinical career and kind of management career kind of started. And it was so, it's so ironic to me that the same people who will come out and say that, you know, the VA is inefficient, it's causing, you know, it's, it's providing terrible care to our veterans, yada, 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 and they'll rail about the dysfunctions within the VA. And then they'll say something like, but we need a single payer system where the U.S. government, man, you know, manages healthcare for everybody. It's like, well, listen, <laughs> you just said that the VA was super dysfunctional, and who's running the VA? Well, that's the government. And I think, you know, my personal feeling is that the the government does not have it just based off of the size and the scope and all of the intricate pieces going on. The government just isn't capable of running healthcare efficiently and effectively for an entire population, you know, let alone a small VA system like that. So the idea that what we need is to, to give the government more control over the healthcare system because that's going to really fix it just doesn't, just doesn't do it for me personally. Um, your, your ideas may vary, your thoughts may vary, and that's fine. I hope that we can have a discussion going forward as society about what the correct role is of health insurance and government regulation and the private market and the government controlled market and how we can mend these things together so that we get the best of all the worlds, right? Because there are some things that the private healthcare market does that's wonderfully efficient and there are some ways in which it falls short, specifically around people that... um, that don't have health care coverage, that don't have health insurance and the rising costs and all of that. Like, I totally get that. I worked as a consultant with, uh, with George's Department of Behavioral Health, and the people that we served, the individuals that we served, would were only receiving care because they had a Medicaid waiver, right? And that was a government-funded program, and these people were, they are the, the most vulnerable among us. And for me, being being somebody who's worked with this population and seen the impact of not having quality care, the idea that we just move 100%, uh, you pay for yourself, also doesn't sit with me just because there are people that just can't pay for it, right? It's it's a very tough nut to crack. And I think in any of these kind of discussions around healthcare and what we do with it, it's very easy to be all or nothing one way or the other, you know, like, it has to be 100% government controlled in order for it to be, you know, equitable and fair and for work for it to work well. Or it's no, we need to shed everything and it needs to be an entirely private pay and all of that. And I think the the answer is going to be somewhere in the middle, right? It's never it's never that easy. It's never cut and dry. And it is definitely going to be, as Dr. Sabrin said, probably the generational discussion or the defining. Uh, topic for our generation over the next several years about what we do with this runaway cost of healthcare and how how can we develop a system that serves everybody um, at least maybe not equally but serves e- that gives everybody the same opportunity of of quality healthcare and that's really what we want is just quality healthcare those outcomes that we are all looking for um, so. It's a tough nut to crack for sure, and I'm not gonna, I am not gonna be able to sit here and tell you that I, I know the answer because I definitely do not. Hopefully, though, conversations like this help move the needle and just help spark some discussion around 
the ideas that are out there and, and what we can do as a society to, to provide health care to everybody, everybody that needs it. I think his idea about the voluntary clinics and all that is wonderful as well, and maybe that's, that's something we can explore further. So that's all I've got to say about that. Anyways, if you like the show, you like what we're doing, head on over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review. It helps people find us, find the show. And if you want to learn about how Rehab U Practice Solutions can help fill your clinic with clients that are engaged and who value the services you provide, or if you're looking to develop interprofessional and interdisciplinary collaborative environments and structures or systems, um, head on over to www.rehabupracticesolutions.com and learn about how we can help. Until the next time, folks, be safe, be healthy. I'll talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the Better Outcome Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Our hope is that you walk away from each episode informed, equipped, and empowered to push the boundaries in your own practice or business. We want to give you the tools to help you build strong, long-lasting relationships with your patients and clients, helping meet their goals, improve their health, and achieve better outcomes. Learn more at www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.